Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you won't miss a new episode. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted and privileged to have a conversation with Hendrik Fisker. Hendrik, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Good to be on the show. Hendrik, let me introduce Hendrik, who he is. He's uh, born in Denmark, but living in the U.S. Now, you might not immediately recognize the name, but I'm for certain you're going to recognize his work because it's been featured in shows like uh, Two and a Half Men, in films like Paranoia with Harrison Ford and Lime Hamsworth, and is featured in James Bond film The World Is Not Enough. Well, if you haven't guessed it so far, Hendrik designs and builds cars. First working for BMW and Aston Martin, and uh, later he gave his own name uh, to his own first company, two companies, first Fischer uh, Automotive and then Fischer Inc. Received numerous honors and awards, just to name a few, Time Magazine Green Design, Top Gear Car of the Year, Fast Company Innovation by Design, and Motor Trend Top 10 Future Classics. Again, Hendrik, thank you so much to be here. We're going to talk about cars. We're going to talk about innovation and leadership. Now, was it in your karma that you started to, to design cars? How did that happen? When did you design your first car? Well, first of all, I was always uh, interested in cars and excited about cars since I was, I don't know, three, four years old, mm -hmm. like probably a lot of people playing with matchbox cars or whatever. And I just stayed in there and wanted to be a car designer. Uh, and uh, after school in Switzerland, in the car design school, I joined BMW in 1989. And my first project was actually an electric car, which I didn't like at the time because nobody liked electric cars, uh, called the E1. Mm -hmm. uh, but then later I moved on to work a bit on the first X5, BMW X5, and then a I designed the BMW uh, Z8 sports car, which were really sort of the breakthrough. Nice. Uh, gr great designs and great cars indeed, future classics. Uh, but once you started your own company, you immediately moved into electric cars. You're very early in the game. Why did you go for electric? Well, you know, I, I, I love cars and I couldn't imagine a world without cars and without private mobility. And uh, I came to the point back in, in sort of 2005 and six, where I really felt uh, if the car industry don't change and we don't move into more sustainable vehicles, uh, we, we may not have private mobility in the future. Uh, the politicians for sure would be quick to ban, ban cars as soon as they can. Uh, so, and you know, I grew up in a country with a lot of public transportation in Denmark. And I never, you know, woke up in the morning dreaming of taking the bus, but I woke up in the morning dreaming of owning a car. Uh, so in 2000, uh, sort of five, six timeframe, uh, I decided that, uh, you know, really it was around 2007, I think I decided, you know, I want to try and see if we could make a, a real sustainable vehicle. And it really came after I saw Leonardo DiCaprio drive to the Oscars in a Toyota Prius, uh, I think it was 2006. Yeah. And uh, that kind of gave me the idea to why don't we make a really cool looking uh, sustainable vehicle? And it kind of was beyond just doing an electric car. So we put the world's largest solar roof. We put a vegan interior first time. We used reclaimed wood. I think we were out a little early. Uh, people didn't really understand it. Uh, you know, why do we need reclaimed wood? What is vegan interior? Can you eat it? You know, all this type of funny stuff. So we, we did have... Uh, a small following. Uh, in fact, in Holland, in the Netherlands, we were the third most sold luxury car for a couple of months in 2012 uh, and did quite well there. Uh, and we also sold the first vehicle to Leonardo DiCaprio, actually. So uh, we got off and, and kind of realized there's definitely a market. Unfortunately, it was very early out uh, in the days with electrification. So our battery supplier went bankrupt in 2012, so we couldn't continue. But of course, now we have started off Fisker Inc., sort of a Fisker 2.0, and we're coming out uh, with an electric SUV, the Fisker Ocean, which we do aim to be, again, the world's most sustainable vehicle, doing much more effort in, in a whole bunch of areas of the car sustainability. 
that's a lot of information you just shared with us. It raises a number of questions for me. Uh, first of all, your decision to go with sustainable electric cars. Uh, you were working for Aston Martin at the time, if I remember correctly. Why did you then decide to do it yourself with your own um, company rather than uh, going with the organization who was already making cars? I mean, is, is that connected or not? Well, I don't think that answer needs a very long explanation. I think the automotive industry have answered itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's taken the, the traditional automotive industry until now. Uh, 10 years later to start coming out with electric cars, you know, Tesla has been at it and successful at it since I would say 2013 and nine years later, uh, the old first, now the giants are waking up. So that I, I don't think that would have been a possibility to do what I've done, uh, within a traditional automaker. It would be out of the question. Now, I can remember when the first Prius came out, uh, came out uh, it, it had a very mixed uh, feeling uh, or re uh, responses. You either loved it or you hate it or you laughed about it. Um, was that also a part of your decision to explicitly design luxury cars, like you can combine electricity and top-end cars? Yeah, I think sustainability and luxury can definitely go hand in hand, and we see it. Uh, from everywhere today, also within the restaurant industry, uh, food, clothes, fashion. You know, it's a lot of fashion now. There's not using fur anymore. Um, so, I, and I think, uh, you know, I really wanted to prove you could make an absolutely gorgeous, sustainable vehicle. And that's really what the Fisker Karma was. And even today it turns heads when you see it in the street. Uh, and, you know, now we're, we're moving to the next level, but we also want to prove an affordable car can be good looking section sustainability okay so there's going to be uh, an affordable fisker car coming out soon is that what you're saying or not that's right we have an affordable fisker ocean suv coming out uh, okay. later this year starting at about forty thousand euro in, in in europe and there's thirty seven thousand five hundred dollars here in the us uh, so we are pretty excited about it good that's definitely something to watch out for now We'll see if that car gets a prize as well, because I've noticed you, you got a lot of recognition, both for car design and innovation, uh, different categories. Which category are you most proud of? Well, you know, design and innovation can definitely come together, but, you know, I'm a designer at heart. I love uh, car design uh, and I, I still do it personally at Fisker. It's a passion of mine. Uh, so I think I'm really proud when people turn around and, and look at a car and then even put money down to buy it because they love the looks. I think then once you get into it, you obviously want to see innovative details. And I don't think it only has to be technology. There's many areas you can innovate in, but technology, of course, is one of them. But there's many other areas you can innovate as well, like using, for example, sustainable materials. OK, now, when you design your cars, what inspires you and what inspires you in general? You know, I think life, nature, uh, the, the sort of pursuit of a cleaner and better world. And I think if I just think about the, the volumes and the sculptures, you know, I, I kind of just get inspiration from thinking, uh, you know, about shapes, about the overall proportion of a vehicle. My, my inspiration is maybe more from nature. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it can come from many different things. I can get inspired by seeing you know, a, a woman's handbag that's made out of a unique material and get inspired if I see an old car that I forgot driving past me and it, wow, they've got a beautiful rear fender. I can get inspired by a, a piece of product design. So I think inspiration is, is everything I see in life. Uh, and so, so that inspires me when I do a design. Okay. And uh, are there any people which uh, inspire you as well? Because so far it's been nature and uh, objects. Well, you know, I think there's not one particular person, but there's many people I think have done uh, amazing things that each one, uh, I, I would say, have put some, given me some inspiration. I mean, a couple of examples would be, of course, Steve Jobs, which, you know, changed the mobile phone, phone industry with a radical design, a radical technology, the touchscreen, but it was sort of that whole package that came together perfectly. I think another person was Richard Branson when he started an airline, something mm -hmm. that probably anybody would have said was insane and impossible. 
he still did it. And when you walked in the first, you know, try, I remember getting my first Virgin airplane. It was like, wow, this has nothing to do with what we know about airplanes. So, you know, I think those stories are inspirational because they, they made a transformation. They went up against impossible big conglomerates. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're in the middle of right now. You know, we're up against giant automakers, uh, you know, that is selling millions of vehicles, has been on the market for a hundred years. And, you know, when you look on paper, it's that mission sounds impossible, uh, but I like that mission. And you've put, you're pulling it off, although there was a hiccup. You, uh, you, you already mentioned in your own introduction that um, your first company um, that um, went down because of uh, one of the supplies of the batteries. How much time and what uh, did, was it between the first company and the second company? Uh, in a sense, was there a moment you said, okay, I've had enough, or do you want to keep... Uh, I'm going to get back in the game. Well, you know, I, I have had many hiccups in my career, uh, you know, big and small ones. And I think the important thing is you learn from, you know, some of the difficulties you've had in, in your career. And you obviously want to avoid doing anything in that direction again. Uh, when we ended Fisker or when Fisker Automotive uh, was ended uh, was back in I think 2013 for me at least uh, as I left the company or uh, 2013 and, and uh, it wasn't like I, I said I had enough I probably was more like a, a, a boxer getting a knockout in the ring you need a little bit of time to kind of <laughs> rejuvenate yourself and heal the wounds uh, and once that was done uh, a few years later you know I wanted to get back in unfortunately uh, it was very difficult for me to get my name back. I couldn't do anything with my name on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that took some lawyers and some time. So we were able to start off Fisker Inc. Uh, mm -hmm. sort of 2.0 in 2016. Uh, so it did take us a few years to get going, uh, but a lot of lessons learned. And, and I think a lot of our investors that came in early really appreciated uh, that we didn't have to go out and make those first time mistakes are probably a lot of the other EV startups now are doing. Uh, and I think that's kind of one of our advantages uh, that we have had so far. Okay. Now you already talked about some, uh, I'd say bumpy roads. Uh, uh, can you identify what are the key milestones in hindsight? And are you also aware if these, this was a key milestone the moment it happened? You know, the times are very different. So you can take some lessons learned and some things are just hindsight. So for example, it's easier to sit today and say, hey, if I could choose a battery maker, I would choose, you know, one that's already made batteries for 10 years because I know they're reliable. Mm -hmm. When I go back in 2010, uh, you know, 12 years ago, there was only three battery makers and nobody had made batteries for 10 years. You know, Tesla was Panasonic. GM was with LG Kim mm -hmm. and we went with a startup company because there was nothing else available. So it wasn't really a choice, but I think the lessons learned was for me that even though I have startup battery companies knocking on my door pretty much every week, claiming they've invented something new, uh, we decided not to take that risk this time. We decided to go with the world's largest battery maker, uh, CHL, and we signed a, a binding agreement with them to supply us batteries. Uh, which I think is extremely important for the success of our, our company because we know we have access to battery supply. So that's an example of where we have taken a different decision than we did originally. Got that. Good example. Now, with the new company, how many people of the old Fisker cars came with you to the new company? Well, you know, we when Fisker Automotive originally ceased in 13. Uh, a lot of the people obviously left to other companies. However, we were able to assemble some of the old gang, uh, some of the old band and, and, and came back with us. Uh, specifically, there was a couple of people that came in very early. So I don't know how many it is, but I would probably say maybe 20, 25 people from the original Fisco Automotive. It might be a little bit more, but something I would say in that region. So... So being the company being so small at the time, I would assume you had a, a personal experience in getting those people on board. 
what do you look in people when you ask them to join your company? Well, you know, some of these people came a little later in uh, and some came early in. But I think generally what I look at is uh, the ability to be um, take initiative. Uh, that's extremely important in a startup environment because you don't have 100 people doing the job. Mm -hmm. You sometimes have one or two people and you have to be active. You have to take initiative. Uh, a lot of times there's not time for a manager to tell you what to do every day. Uh, we were really created during COVID. We hired 90% of our people during COVID, starting from you know 2020, a couple of years ago. And that means that we expect everybody to you know turn in on Zoom on time, show up, uh, put on the camera, uh, work at home and actually work, not just chill out and watch TV and pretend you're working. Uh, you know, and those are the type of things I'm looking for in people that they have that responsibility, they have that energy. I think the rest in terms of having, you know, the skills and the talent and all that, yeah, of course. But I think this is a real key thing for us and why we are able to move so fast uh, because we have people that I think pretty much all of them have that kind of uh, uh, attribute where they know that we expect them to take initiative, work hard, even unsupervised. Okay, so attitude in your mind is more important than somebody's experience. Yeah, I mean, look, of course, there's certain areas where you need experience. We can't hire everybody straight out of school because that wouldn't be possible. But I think it's not about, uh, you know, I think if you have two people, both with 10 years experience, but one person's resume looks a little better than the other. If the other is way more, uh, uh, you know, attentive and ready to take initiative uh, and have energy, et cetera, I would rather hire that person because we just don't have time to supervise people and we don't know what people are doing at home when their camera is on. Yeah. So we need people that, that have that uh, or show that uh, uh, um, you know, ability and that feeling when we interview them. Uh, you know, it is, we're in a very competitive environment. It's not a nine to five job. You know, if people ask me, hey, is it tough to work at Fisker? What's the working culture? You know, do I have to pick up a call in the weekend? Yeah, you do. Yeah. It's, it's not a nine to five job. And yes, sometimes we have weekend calls. In fact, I personally have uh, weekend calls every weekend mm -hmm. uh, because we have to be faster and better than our competitors. So it, it is a high demand job. And but fortunately, it's fun. And a lot of people like to do it. What does this mean for your own uh, leadership style? Uh, how would you uh, identify yourself as a leader? Well, I think I give people a lot of freedom uh, to work in their own uh, kind of pace, the way they feel they should be doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have high expectations of people being uh, self-sufficient and taking initiative and developing the best. My leadership style is not to ask for variations just for the sake of it. I'd rather have the right solution quick than five average solutions. So they have, so I have a choice um, mm -hmm. and I believe in engaging early on in the subject matter. Uh, I'd rather see a rough idea and discuss it versus having somebody work for six months an idea that then turns out doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And now this six months is wasted. Uh, so, and, and I like to get into the details as well. Um, not on everything. Um, there are certain things where I know I have limited knowledge and then I, I trust, I find the, the, the managers or uh, you know, the leaders that I trust. Uh, and, and I think it's very important for a leader to surround yourself uh, with people uh, in the areas where you know you're not the absolute best or have the deepest understanding. You must surround yourself with somebody who's way better than yourself and that you learn to trust. Did you know this from yourself or did somebody have to tell you this? No, I think you, you, I, I discovered that. And I think anybody who claims to be the best in everything is just not true to themselves. You cannot be the best at everything. It just isn't possible. So you must recognize where you're not the best. You have to recognize where your passion is and where you have zero passion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you should look at those areas and find people with passion that can do that job with passion for you. 
that brings me to that's a, a nice segue because uh, Fisker is a family business, i.e., your wife is the CFO. Now, is that an asset or does it get in the way sometimes? No, I think it's a huge asset. I don't think you can make a general statement about that. I think it's totally personality driven. Yeah. Uh, there may be couples that can work together, and I'm sure there's couples who cannot work together. So, therefore, it's not a statement that is one size fits all. Uh, in our case, it fits extremely well because uh, uh, Gita, uh, our CFO, she has a passion for numbers. She has a passion for uh, finance, for operations. And I have a passion for development uh, and design, marketing, uh, you know, the other areas of the business. So that's why it fits so well, because we each have our passion. They kind of covers the entire business. And of course, there's an ultimate trust that would be hard to find uh, outside a couple. And, you know, we founded the company together, uh, which is important. It's not like, uh, you know, she happened to be my wife and therefore the CFO. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully I didn't happen to be the husband and therefore happened to be the CEO. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was really like a co-founding uh, where she was out there uh, leading the role of financing from the beginning. And she still has that leading role. Um, so I think she has uh, her own status in the company, uh, just like I do. There's no difference there. Okay. Because uh, I'm, I'm just interested or curious to know, uh, does that mean uh, the company is with you 24-7? Or do you allow yourself downtime to, think, to do something completely different? Unfortunately, or fortunately, it does mean it's with us 24 seven, uh, you just can't separate that. But we have so much passion that uh, it probably means we're even more efficient that we can discuss this any time of the day or evening. Uh, of course, there is times when you do things uh, which have nothing to do with our work. Mm -hmm. But it's a very little, at this point, very little portion in our private life where we do that. It's probably almost you can count in the minutes. Uh, so uh, it, it's, I think it's a life uh, call to do what we're doing. And unless you're willing to work seven days a week, 18 hours a day, first of all, I don't think you could yeah. even survive this business yeah. and you definitely can't be successful. If it's a life call, um, have you then also thought about how, the, how do you want the world to remember you? I don't think much about that I don't think about anybody remembering me. I think about life. I think yeah. about living. I think about doing what I can for this world while I'm alive. I'm less concerned about what people think about me when I'm dead. Okay. Uh, what are the lessons learned uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, which you feel are most relevant or useful to pass on to a next generation, to young managers who are starting off the, uh, their journey? Well, I think, you know, one of the lessons learned for me is that it's very good to have a foundation in, in uh, the outside or corporate business life before you become an entrepreneur, because it's good to have seen the other side of the wall, what's behind it and why it may not function, why you think you can do it better. It's not good to assume you can do something better if you don't know already why it's wrong or what's wrong with it. So I spent a good portion of my career, you know, with great car companies. And uh, I think that was important for me to be successful later in life as an entrepreneur. Secondly, I think it's important to understand that as an entrepreneur, specifically in the early days, uh, you have no safety net. You have no big support organization. Uh, and you have to find an extremely talented small group of people who is as passionate as you have as you are to be successful so that i think is is, is too important thing and then finally you got to have of course an idea that uh, not only you believe in but really has a differentiating factor that offers something new to people that they are willing to pay for in that respect what does success mean to you how do how would you define success in this case well, I think success is a moving target. You know, you have you you have stages of success. So I don't think about an ultimate success where after I've reached that, I don't have to do anything. I think about success probably uh, every week, sometimes 
every day. Uh, but if I just lay it out every year, for me, success this year is delivering the Fisker Ocean on time to the first customers uh, in November. Yep. Uh, that's starting a production. So that is a big success milestone for, 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 for me this year. I think uh, in, in the next future years, in the next two or three years, success is, is having a company that's profitable, that has now several models in production, and uh, ultimately success is to be among uh, the most successful, uh, highest earning, uh, highest producing car companies in the world. Okay, and uh, also because I saw today uh, uh, you posted on LinkedIn uh, that you're going to be the first, um, uh, providing the first digital radar in a production car. So being the first in something, is that also what drives you? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's part of, of, of being successful, at least in the car world. Uh, you know, we are, we are in an industry that's extremely competitive. There's a lot of choice for people. And being a new entrant, I think you have to have something where you're first. Uh, it can be many different things. It doesn't have to be technology. Uh, it can be first with a very unique concept of a design of a part or something, a detail or something. In this case, uh, it's a technology point. And, uh, you know, being first in, in this industry really just means you get a bit of a, a factor where you get recognized for it and therefore probably get sort of that first mover element. But ultimately, in the car industry, if it's technology, it ultimately reaches everybody at one stage because volume is kind of the name of the game in the automotive industry. And, and for any sort of technology to be successful in the automotive industry, it has to be made with volume. And for that to happen, it usually has to get into multiple brands of cars, uh, just like, you know, anti-lock brakes or power steering or cruise control. All these elements once were for maybe a few luxury cars, but eventually got into every car. So I expect, you know, for example, the digital radar to, of course, reach other companies, but we were able to get it out first because we moved faster than our competitors. Uh, and uh, that's that I think is going to be an advantage for us being able to launch it this year. Well, good on you. So um, impressive. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights in how you've built uh, Fisker Inc., how you had to restart your ideas on what you look at an employee, what you look at leadership. Um, for me, you've given me a complete picture of what makes you tick, uh, Henrik. So I want to thank you so much for sharing that with the audience for the brand called you, because this is an audience of entrepreneurs, of people around the world who uh, actually, just like you, are uh, global citizens. So thank you for sharing that lessons with us. Thank you, Fred. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.